Um, so um, as um, Isha mentioned that I do have, um, so I migrated to Australia in the year 2000 and uh, till that time I was working at Indian Agricultural Research Institute. So all my roots and my grounding uh, to Indian Agricultural Research Institute. Uh, but in Australia, most of the time I've been really focused on applied research, uh, which sort of has that industry engagement focus. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, RNA-based biopesticides, and especially focusing on a transformational platform uh, called BioClay. Um, I don't think so. I need to, you know, tell this August audience anything about the issues with pesticides. We all know, and um, you know, Akshya gave a wonderful talk on gene editing, which once again shows, you know, if we want, we are clever. Pathogens are cleverer. They can always beat us to things, you know, they can develop resistance against the pesticides. But not only that, there are other issues as well. The issues of residual toxicity on crops is a major issue anywhere across the globe. Um, Australians worry a lot about their Great Barrier Reef, you know, or runoff of the pesticides going into the precious waterways. Another issue that we all hear about is lack of specificity of broad spectrum pesticides. We do want to kill the harmful pests and pathogens, but we don't want to kill our beautiful butterflies and bees and the other useful microflora. And it's very difficult to develop new chemicals. Green chemistries are very hard to come by. Um, we were hearing about CRISPR from Akshay, one of the, you know, once again, another approach um, which can be used for crop protection. If we look at green chemistries, uh, the crop, in, crop Life International says that it takes about 13 years and only maybe one in 139,000 chemicals actually make from lab to market. And the investment is huge, around $250 million to find new chemistry. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a space which is difficult, but we sort of have to continue. And this is where um, I'm going to talk to you about a new approach of using RNA interference for crop protection. And RNA interference technology is not new to us. Once again, this also earned the Nobel Prize about two decades ago. However, till now, most of the time, RNAi or RNA interference has been used to generate transgenic crops or genetically modified disease resistant crops. And that's been working, but once again, there have been issues. So the idea that we were looking at or we started looking at in the year 2013 was that can we deliver RNA interference as a spray instead of genetically modifying the plant? Uh, so the trigger molecule of RNAi, as the word suggests, RNA interference, uh, is double-stranded RNA. Uh, in transgenic plants, what we do is when we generate a genetically modified plant, we introduce the double-stranded our DNA construct into the plant to express the double-stranded RNA, and that's how it affords protection. Um, I am all for genetically modified plants. I'm not saying that at all that we, but there are issues. There are issues of community acceptance. There are issues regarding regulation of use. That's what is the major hindrance for the adoption of GM crops. Um, every country has different jurisdictions and a long time for approval. Um, in Australia, once again, GM food products are not at all um, approved. We only have BT cotton and canola, and that's the only two sort of uh, GM approved products, uh, crops in Australia. And then for me as a researcher, it is not just about regulations, we can address them. However, it is the cost and time involved. And once again, we heard before as well, it will take you know 10 to 12 years or maybe more to develop. And also lack of transformation protocols. 
once again going to back to Akshay's talk, you know, he was saying on, you know, how they saw wheat transformation. Now, some of the transformations for crops, you know, when I look at horticultural crops, especially, it's easy, you know, with um, tomato or capsicum. But when you think of uh, mango, when you think of lychees, when you think of citrus, when you think of avocados that I'm working on, it's very difficult. Uh, even for to introduce CRISPR or to do anything, there are no tr good transformation protocols available. So how do we handle that issue when we cannot even introduce tools such as gene editing or when, where we cannot even genetically modify? So this is where RNA-based biopesticides come in. Uh, and I always feel, you know, I thought of this concept in the year 2013 and I thought, Oh, wow, you know, can we just spray the double-stranded RNA from a pathogen onto a crop instead of genetically modifying it? And, you know, sometimes when you think of that idea, you feel very proud, oh, what a wonderful idea, and let me try. And then you start looking at the Google friend and you start looking at the literature and you find Someone has already looked at it. And I was quite surprised that in 2003, actually a group of researchers, Telado et al. in Spain, had published a small paper which showed um, that um, RNA-based biopesticides to control. And in this case, they had done it with pepper mild mortal virus. And if in this leaf, um, you can see that half of the leaf uh, they sprayed with the double-stranded RNA targeting the virus and other half of the leaf was unsprayed and both were challenged. And you can see there is a difference in the disease symptoms. And this particular image is really stuck in my mind, which shows you know, that this concept can work. So I was a bit intrigued that why, what is happening here is such an important thing and it hasn't gained you know, traction. And if we look at now, uh, this world of RNA-based biopesticides that is using just RNA as a topical spray application, or we call it spray-induced gene silencing, it really works. You know, there are maybe, I don't know, this is an old slide, maybe now uh, 12 papers, I think now or in terms of viruses, it might be now exploding. Um, into about 32 papers showing that the system works on different viruses, viroids, host plant, 11 different host plants, and not only viruses, but insect pests and fungi as well. So the question was, why, if this technology is there, why isn't it going anywhere? Why aren't we seeing anything in terms of products or looking more towards its re real value? And that is when you read, you know, these papers and you read, uh, reach to the end of the publication and there will be a paragraph saying that naked RNA when it is sprayed on the plant is highly unstable. Um, it can de gets degraded by enzymes on the leaf surface. It is not protected from UV and sunlight. It can get washed away easily. And therefore the protection window lasts only for five to seven days after spray. And this is a huge major issue. You know, you can't have growers um, going and spraying their crop every five days with an RNA spray. It has to work in a system that is compatible with what the grower needs or the farmer needs. And this is an example of a paper from um, Gann et al. in 2010, where again, they showed it works on sugarcane mosaic virus um, on maize. And the critical thing was that if you spray the plant on day zero and you challenge it with the virus on day zero, yes, it's beautiful. However, if you spray the plant on day zero, but challenge it with the virus at day seven, the protection is gone. And as you can see here, nine days, it's completely gone as well. So they, they showed that the stability of DSRNA spray maybe lasts only for five to seven days. And this has been the case with any of the publications that we have seen even till today. So this is where um, this beautiful concept of bioclay was born, which I'll explain um, soon. And the question that I was asking was, is there another way? Can we deliver RNA as a spray, but as a stable application? Can we prolong its longevity? Can we make it more effective? 
how can we convert these experiments into a commercially viable system for farmers? Um, stabilize. It should be degradable. It should not leave any residue, but it should stick to the plants. It should be protected from rain. Not that if it starts raining, your thing is washed away. Easy to adopt as well, so that you know it can be uh, easily um, sort of have that window of adoption moving forward. Uh, and this is um, sort of when we went into this concept of RNA as the biological agent which I've talked about, or the double-stranded RNA as the active, but clay particles as delivery agent. And so the bio in the word bio clay, bio is the RNA or the active, and clay particles, I call them just like a fancy postman, you know, a delivery agent, a carrier, which can carry this RNA. And um, this is the famous slide, you know, picture taken by the marketing team of UQ uh, of the university. So I do use it. And my very fortunate um, PhD student who has a publication now in Nature to her credit. So she's very happy as well. And um, my postdoc Carl, who has been really wonderful in making this technology possible. And this particular work was initially funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. However, it was um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, was just initial innovate money to just test the proof of concept. So they, I'm really pleased to say that from Gates Foundation, we got only $100,000, but with no strings attached. They gave it, they said, test it. If it works, um, go forward and do whatever you want to with it. And uh, from that $100,000, we have now actually attracted $35 million of funding to make this bioclay product possible. So this is how sometimes um, with God's grace, I think uh, things move forward in a nice way. So I'll tell you a little bit more that bioclay, it's a spray application. So we do not need to alter the plant genome. The RNA that we are spraying is the finite amount of RNA that we are spraying. It's not getting integrated into the plant. There's no multiplication of that RNA. The clay layers, they degrade naturally leaving no residue. And we do have an extended stability and slow release on the plant surface. I call this technology almost nature versus nature. So you are using the RNA of the pest or the pathogen to kill the pest or pathogen itself. Uh, and that's something which makes it really nice. Um, as I said, the dsRNA is the trigger molecule and the clay is a layered double hydroxide, uh, which is just magnesium and iron in this case. Um, there is nothing else in it. It's on just a charged binding. Double-stranded RNA is negatively charged, the clay is positively charged, and that's how the RNA gets loaded onto the clay. And this is where the clay matrix binds to it and then protects it uh, or provides those attractive features. So what we do is we have this clay and we load the double-stranded RNA onto it, spray it onto the plant, very natural mechanism of release of this RNA on the plant. The carbon dioxide and moisture on the atmosphere is enough to release this RNA from the clay into the leaf. The RNA then enters inside the leaf and that's where the natural RNAi mechanism kicks in. So we don't have to do anything else other than design the double-stranded RNA constructs targeting the virus and express the dsRNA and load it onto the clay. And this loading is very simple as well. I am not a nano engineer. It was designed by Professor Max Lu and Gordon Zhu. And I was very worried, you know, I'm a biologist. And they were saying, oh, we'll give you the clay part particles and then you can load the double-stranded RNA on it. And I was thinking, gosh, how is that going to happen? And uh, I still remember the day with them walking with a chalky white solution, but it is really simple process. You put RNA into that clay and you shake it for 10 minutes and it gets loaded. So it's a simple process as well, which makes it attractive. 
So as I said, it really works. So here you can see um, on a leaf surface, um, the RNA was sprayed on day zero as a naked and uh, in this case as a clay. As this blot, these black blobs show after 10 days, the naked is hardly visible. Whereas even after 30 days, when sprayed as a bio clay, you can still detect the double stranded RNA on the leaf surface. Then we have um, simulated done simulation rain experiments. Now, of course, we have done even actual experiments in the field. And this is naked DSRNA and clay before wash. And we then we wash the leaves vigorously. You can see that after wash, you hardly can see any naked DSRNA, but this fluorescently labeled DSRNA is still visible. We have also shown that the double-stranded RNA actually enters into the veins and into the cells of the plants. But most importantly, we have shown that it extends the protection window. And this is the same system which Tenlado has used in 2003. I wrote to him, I told him if you could send me the same DSRNA construct that you used for pepper mild mortal virus, and we will see if we have improved that. And he was very kind enough to share that with us. And we repeated the same experiment. Now, in this case, the plants were sprayed on day zero and challenged with the virus on day 20. That is 20 days after the spray and still the protection is there. We have now gone forward and it even works up to 30 and 40 days of the spray. This is um, once again, just an example of uh, control of tomato spotted wilt virus. Once again, here is an unsprayed plant and here is a sprayed plant. And this just shows, you know, once sprayed and protected, uh, the plants remain protected. And it really is sort of a chalk and cheese kind of a difference. Uh, not only that, uh, the question was fine, you know, in, when you inoculate it with virus, normally you do it on a sprayed leaf by mechanical inoculation. And that's what we were doing as well. The question then the growers asked me, the plant is going to grow, you know, new leaves are going to come out. What about if the virus comes on the new leaves? And normally it does. So how, how is that going to happen? So then we, we know that RNAi is systemic in nature. That is the RNA can move inside the plant, but we needed to show that it works. So what we did was that we sprayed the lower leaves, we marked them, we covered the apex, and then we challenged the apex or the new growth with cucumber mosaic virus in this case. Um, and if you look at the lower, uh, the bottom two graphs, these are water treated plants, of course, showing CMV infection. And in this case, only one out of 16 plants which were challenged on the new leaves, not the old sprayed leaves, showed infection. So this proved that yes, systemicity of RNAi and that topical application of RNAi or spray application of RNAi can provide the protection as well. Um, we are then moved on and we are still working on these number of viruses now affecting a large number of crops. Um, but we are also looking at fungal diseases um, by controlling just by spraying. And in this case, we are collaborating with a group by, led by Professor Haling Jin in the University of California, Riverside. Now, as you can see here, um, these are now not only for pre farm gate or, you know, crops are grown in the field or fruits grown in the field. This is about post harvest as well. In here, you can see these, this lower panel is the one which has been sprayed with the DSRNA. And there is a protection from botrytis in tomato, strawberry, grapes, lettuce leaves, onion, rose. And we have now extended that window and having a look at both pre and post harvest control of botrytis. Um, in my team, we are also working on phytophthora and I know uh, the chair, Dr. Parthasathi, was mentioning about you know the Phytophthora famine and the uh, Phytophthora infestants. At this stage, we are looking at Phytophthora cinnamomai and Phytophthora nicotiana, just because we are working on crops such as pineapple and avocados. And once again. Um, we have shown, and this is in a model system of lupins. Um, as you can see here, these seedlings were treated, were inoculated with Phytophthora cinnamomai, and these are water controls. And this panel is where uh, we have treated this with the DSRNA as well. And once again, we are getting very good protection from Phytophthora cinnamomai. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that it is 
on an application stage because every crop has different, but at least the proof of concept is there that it will work against Phytophthora cinnamomai. And we are doing some pineapple bioassays as well. Um, as you can see here in the water, we had both the... Sorry. Okay, the fungus and the double-stranded RNA, and you can see the protection um, that it affords um, from the pathogen. Uh, we are also looking at uh, insect pests and um, both sucking and chewing insect pests, especially insect pests such as aphids and white flies, and um, also looking at thrips. And uh, we had the pleasure of having Dr. Senthil Kumar, actually, who must be there in this conference, I believe. Uh, he actually visited and spent six months with us. And um, he, he did some excellent work, actually, on uh, setting up the system for thrips. So I'm very pleased to say that very soon, I think we'll be reaching out to Senthil because we have advanced in that work and have a little bit of a proof of concept that we have done for Trip. So I'm sure we will be writing a joint publication together with him. So thank you, Senthil, for starting that work with us. Um, not just once again, as we know for anything, it is really important to keep the regulatory aspects in mind. Um, RNAi, yes, it can target viruses, fungi, and pests, but the simplicity of this technique, but the specificity is very important here. And what we can do is the bioinformatics can help us design RNA, which is specific just to the pest, so we can avoid any unintended or off-target impacts, um, so that we are not targeting anything else other than the pathogen. And that's very, very critical. And that's something which we are looking into. So I am on the actually on the panel of OECD, which is um, European uh, Organ Regulatory Framework. So I'm representing that on developing these regulatory platforms for the topical RNAi. And some of the concerns, you know, what if RNA is inhaled? What if there is a dermal exposure? What if you are eating that RNA? And in this case, the answer is very simple. We all the time eat the RNA of the pathogens. You don't even know what viruses are present inside the plant or there are latent viruses present. And double-stranded RNA is something um, which, is in, which is produced by the endogenous genes of the plants as well. So there is no issue, but there are experiments that have been done to show that even if you consume anything, the double-stranded RNA does not do any, any, it does not even survive. Yeah, so it's some something, a rhetorical question in a way. And um, risks to the environment, it's rapidly degrades in the environment. So it's, there is, it won't, it is not going to persist and there is no basis for concentration of topical applied DSRNA in the food chain. Um, very pleased to say that because we started working on this, I really put up a case to our Office of the Gene Technology Regulator in Australia, uh, that they are the ones who control our uh, GMO regulations. And took me three years, many trips to Canberra, our capital, to talk to them, present to them all the data, and uh, absolutely thrilled that this work of ours has re resulted in a policy change now. So the gene technology amendment has been done and legislated in Australia that topical RNAi is, with, is being considered as non-GM. We were saying it is non-GM, but now the regulator has said that as well. So that's really pleasing. US is all fine. Um, Japan is okay. They have declared it non-GM. Many other countries, uh, Europe, Europe doesn't say anything. So Europe is undecided. They don't call it GM. They don't call it non-GM. So <laughs> we are still sort of um, trying to get an answer there. Um, we are all, as I said, we are looking at fungal diseases and we have uh, now a hub which is um, leading as well. And very pleased to say that the Australian government has given $18 million actually to develop um, bioclay targeting fungal pathogens. And we are looking at botrytis, we are looking um, at verticillium, we are looking at fusarium, sclerotinia, we are looking at different crops now, not just horticultural crops, but crops such as canola and wheat, etc. So yep, the work is going 
forward. And as I said, um, I consider this as a paradigm shift. So it's not just us, it's across the globe. The work is happening on RNA-based biopesticides. And um, the biggest advantage that we are having is we are saying to anyone, and I'm open to this conference as well, anyone who has a double-stranded RNA construct, they know that it works against a pest or a pathogen, let us know we can sign in something with you, we can then load it on the clay and you can test it. And if it works, then we can move forward because in our my lab, we can work only on, you know, a couple of pathogens or pests. It's not, um, and there is a large body of interest there. Um, as I said, this is non-GM finite amount of DSRNA. And the important thing is even if a pathogen mutates or evolves or a pest mutates, um, a, it is very, it would be very easy to design a new construct. And we have developed a protocol now for a designing of software also for the design of the constructs, which takes into account any off targets. And it takes about 10 minutes to come up with the design sequences, so which is very awesome. And as I said, I'm also very keenly involved. I do not consider that any technology will find a place unless and until we take the consumers along with it and also the policy. So um, I think um, I did two comments in Nature Nanotechnology last year um, just on policy regarding um, the applications or nano-enabled agriculture. But also we are developing a social licensing to operate platform. So we really regularly go do to growers fields and also are talking um, to the consumers as well. So we go to our supermarkets as well, asking them if such a product is there, what would be their reaction to it? Ending it now, yeah, for me, um, yeah, it's, it's really um, sort of the possibilities are endless. We are looking at viruses, fungi, as I mentioned, insect pests. Um, we are also thinking that it would have a huge place in protected horticulture or protected cropping or controlled environment glass houses where anyway, due to regulations, you cannot spray many insecticides or fungicides to and also with the post-harvest um, space as well. In fact, we have now started looking in animal health as well. So we are looking at things like sheep lice and blowfly. I don't have the knowledge, but there are others in the team who are now applying this for that. But for any technology, uh, design of regulation and public opinion are critical. Otherwise, it'll just remain you know, in publications. Um, so yeah, thank you from the BioClay team. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you, madam. Very nice presentation, very lucid, very, I think it's self-explanatory, very simple way of presentation. And uh, she has already open invitation to anybody who is having DSRNA, we can collaborate with her. So uh, invitation open to all delegates. Yeah, so very interesting. I think this is a single solution for all pests including uh, fungi, viruses, insect pests. So wonderful uh, technology.